Good morning, everybody. And before I begin, uh, I would like every member who is here from the World Bank Group and the IMF to do me one favor. Wave your hands vigorously. Wave them vigorously. Why are we doing that? You know the butterfly effect? I want the waves from these to be felt around the world of our partnership. That is Kristalina and my commitment to all of you. Together, one plus one is equal to three. And that's very, very important. <laughs> Kristalina, thank you for, as I said in my first annual meeting in Marrakesh, from the day I got nominated, you have been a friend and a partner. And may you always, always feel the same about me. Thank you very much. It's an absolute privilege to stand before all of you at what I think is the convergence of two important moments for the World Bank Group. The first moment is to celebrate what we've achieved in these 80 years, as Kristalina talked about, but also reflect on the lessons that we have learned. And secondly, a moment to memorialize a year of change, of hard work, of progress, but most importantly, to prepare for what I think is the next generation of challenges ahead of us. The World Bank, along with the IMF, we were born in a moment of global upheaval. Kristalina just talked about it. Established in 1944, during the Bretton Woods Conference, it emerged as a response to the widespread devastation caused by World War II. Its original purpose as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development was focused squarely on helping war-torn nations to rebuild. However, even in those early discussions, there was a very spirited debate. By the way, most of the people there were men, but there was one woman. That is a delightful change. Now we have more than one woman involved in all this work. We'll come to that in a minute. But a spirited debate did emerge. Should the World Bank focus solely on reconstruction? Or could it play a broader role in fostering global development? And since then, the world's needs have continued to evolve, and I think the bank and its people have evolved with them. We find ourselves today at a very similar crossroad, where reconstruction is at the forefront due to the wars in Europe, in the Middle East, and in Africa. The lessons from the past have uniquely equipped us to rebuild from today's conflicts. And while reconstruction is essential, our focus has increasingly turned towards development. And that is where the World Bank's heart lies, helping nations emerge from less fortunate circumstances to enable people to reach what I think is really important, which is their own full potential. Today, we face a world of unparalleled complexity. Poverty, climate change, conflict, pandemics, these have all got intertwined. And the modern requirements of reconstruction and development call for an institution that is faster, is simpler, and is more impactful. An institution that is capable of addressing the challenges of our time, but at an unprecedented scale. It is a call that was echoed by our shareholders and our clients when I joined 16 months ago. A mandate to work with the enormously dedicated people of this institution to engineer the evolution of our own institution. Together, we have embarked on this journey to build a better bank and to bring that vision to life. I think we have achieved meaningful improvements across the institution, and we've progressed towards that promise. I'm encouraged that we're moving in the right direction. I know there are measurable milestones there, streamlined operations, a more impact-oriented institution, and increased lending capacity. So first, we are faster, because development delayed is development denied. It's as simple as that. By streamlining our processes, we can move from planning to action more quickly. We can reduce the time it takes to deliver for the countries we serve, for our clients. We have reduced project approval from an average of 19 months to 16, but our real task is to get it to 12 months by June of next year. That's the target. Now, this is manifesting in reality. It uses the platform approach, in fact, recently, we have approved a set of health projects with similar characteristics in five African countries, each in under 100 days. By the way, two of them in under 30 days. We can get to the 12 months. The question is, 
Another example, in the Pacific region, we approved a correspondent banking support project with seven countries in 10 months. So that's our direction of travel. Second, we are simpler because process should never overtake substance. Simplifying our processes helps us to work more efficiently. It helps us to make it easier for our clients, especially those with limited capacity to access our services. And let's remember for the World Bank Group, that is the majority of our clients. We are delivering a unified country partnership framework. We now have 21 joint country heads representing the entire group, IBRD, IDA, MEGA, and IFC. It's still early days, but we can see a shift in a new level of collaboration among our management and our staff. And the initial feedback from countries has been very encouraging. So we're in the process of expanding to 20 more countries early next year, and we're going to keep going. Meanwhile, we've implemented a series of changes you don't get to see, but our clients and our partners do feel them. By unifying many back office functions, budget, corporate procurement, real estate, we can deliver services faster and much better function as a single group of people. We're also working to be a better partner and collaborator with other multilateral development banks, and a few of my friends and colleagues are sitting here. Over the last year, the World Bank has formalized partnerships with five other institutions. We're working together on everything from the Amazon with the Inter-American Development Bank to cross-border trade with the Islamic Development Bank to strengthening health services with the AIIB. Jin is right here. I can see him sitting here. We will soon finalize an agreement with the Asian Development Bank, basically on mutual reliance. When we do that, I think we will deliver real and new efficiencies for our clients. And as a group of MDBs, we now have an online platform that allows development institutions to share projects for co-financing and discuss them securely and transparently. The idea is to reduce administrative burden, reduce transaction costs, better coordinate financing, and frankly, ultimately, get much better development impact for these countries. In six months, we have 100 projects in this pipeline. The first few are now getting to be financed. More work to do on that one. Third, we are more impact-oriented because the results matter. By prioritizing measurable outcomes, we enhance accountability focus efforts across the bank. We ensure that our projects drive real change. Our overall knowledge bank now has the right people in place leading each vertical for the entire institution. They are focused on bringing our expertise to the creation of country partnership frameworks. They want to help countries overcome capacity challenges to develop bankable projects. We've rebuilt our corporate scorecard, moving from 150 items to 22. That simplified set of indicators feeds the cultural shift we are driving reinforces our institution-wide effort to maximize impact. Last week, we published the baseline results for 20 of those metrics. We've shared our measurement formulas going all the way down to projects. Transparency is what we are trying to do. Let shareholders, clients, and taxpayers see the impact we are delivering and where we need to do more. Fourth, we are better organized with more lending capacity. We're leveraging our financial tools strategically. We can expand our reach, deepen our impact without compromising our financial sustainability or our AAA rating. We've aggressively pursued the capital adequacy measures that the G20 framework laid out. We've stretched our existing balance sheet. We've secured additional lending capacity at IBRD of over 150 billion over the next 10 years. A combination of new tools and shareholder generosity has done this for us. It includes hybrid capital, portfolio guarantees, two equity to loan ratio reductions in these past two years. We've built on that foundation by offering new instruments and scaling what we think are known solutions. For example, we've introduced 50-year financing for global public goods at no additional cost. And to respond to a spectrum of needs, we've now begun to offer shorter maturity loans of seven years with lower pricing. We're looking for ways to scale our various financing instruments that pay for results. These tools create a powerful incentive for outcomes, and frankly, they form now a real part of our toolkit. I was telling Christina yesterday, taken together, they added up to nearly half 
of IBRD and IDA loans last year, these pay-for-results programs. Financing the pay-for-results approach and adding the incentive of lower interest rates that we were talking about for global public goods projects led to the launch of the Livable Planet Fund. That's been capitalized now with 200 million from our income alongside early support from Denmark, from Germany, from Iceland and Japan. But we're looking for other governments and philanthropies to chip in. So along with waving your hands, everybody here, please make some noise. We need to get these other people to come in to build up this fund. Before the end of the year, we will launch a project preparation facility, funding it from IBRD income to help countries with capacity challenges and take ideas to bankability. We've got a new mechanism to enhance the value of callable capital, a request for quite some time that is now ready for shareholders to be able to bring it to life. We've taken substantial actions on the pricing of IBRD loans so we can ensure that middle-income countries can borrow from us in better terms. Part of that pricing adjustment, crucially, allows small states eligible for climate resilient debt clauses to borrow at our lowest pricing tier. These elements are all part of a sustained effort. The method in the madness is whenever and wherever we see an opportunity to improve our balance sheet, to optimize its use, to help our clients, we will pursue it. Because when more affordable financing is paired with our knowledge, it just creates a really powerful engine for development. That same spirit of doing all we can is ingrained in our IDA replenishment campaign. Over six decades, 36 countries have graduated from IDA. Many of them are now generous donors in their own right. What they do know is three things. The first, the power of IDA, its grants, its deeply concessional loans. Two, its knowledge that's gained over the years that helps to build capacity for other countries, that transmission line that Chris Lina referred to. Third, IDA's unique capability to multiply every donated dollar three and a half to four times. That gives donors more impact per dollar. It gives clients the ability to take on bigger developmental projects. That's what's helped IDA deploy $270 billion in the last 10 years. IDA is just the best deal in development. There is no better one. More than the funds we deploy are the benefits that people derive. Over the past decade, IDA has helped deliver health services to almost 900 million people around the world, connected 117 million people to reliable electricity, and delivered clean water to 94 million people. It's helped more than 18 million farmers grow more, waste less, and improve their bottom line. Meanwhile, IDA is a lifeline for the world's 78 least well-off countries that will spend close to half of their revenues on debt service this year, as the chair was referring to, and much more than they spend on health, education, and infrastructure combined. In that environment, IDA has provided $16 billion over the last four years to the four countries in the common framework that the IMF and World Bank have been working on together with the G20. That's 16 billion of capital and liquidity. Just remember, of those funds, half were pure grants and half were deeply concessional. We are doing all we can to ensure that IDA has the resources. It needs to be effective. We believe that a focused, simpler IDA provides the best opportunity to breed stability, security, and advanced development. Over time, IDA's required measurements have swelled to nearly 1,100. What we are trying to do is to reduce them to under 400, giving clients more freedom to prioritize and shape their development to suit their country's circumstances. We hope that the IDA pledging summit that South Korea is hosting in December, we hope then we will be able to tell the 17 countries that rely on IDA that a well-resourced and simpler IDA has arrived for them. Even with the improvements of, the web, of this better bank, of this additional capital that we're all working on together, we need to find a way to incentivize the private sector to come in as our force multiplier. A lot of people have talked about private sector mobilization. It's not a panacea. It doesn't happen in a hurry. But it can be done. 
the starting point what, what we did was to publish proprietary investment data to inspire investor confidence in two ways. First, through GEMS, which is a collaborative platform that all the MDBs share, we have published public and sorry, we published private sector default publicly. That's what I wanted to say. I just mixed it up. Private sector default data and recovery rates broken down by country and sector. And we shared sovereign default and recovery rate statistics going back 40 years. That data, by the way, is now on Bloomberg terminals for every private investor to take a look at. Second, IFC published private sector default metrics broken down by credit rating of the borrowers. But data is not going to get us there because the requirement the UN estimates you need $4 trillion every year to get to the development goals. Those resources do not exist between public finances, multilateral banks, and philanthropies. We just need the private sector. And to engage them, they have to see a very clear return and opportunity for their investments. This private sector lab that we set up, which was created to address the imbalance for renewable energy, has identified five areas of focus. We're advancing each. We're looking to deploy lessons to other areas of work. So what's the first one? Regulatory and policy certainty. We're testing our capacity to help governments with this, along with the IMF and the African Development Bank, through our initiative to connect 300 million people in Africa to electricity. Second, political risk insurance. We have simplified our guarantees business. We're being more purposeful about employing it. Already this fiscal year, We've issued three times more guarantees than at this point last year. Hiroshi keeps reminding me that, you know, three months is not a trend. I think Hiroshi is wrong, but we'll see. And I'm sure we will be able to go even further once the platform is fully realized. Third, foreign currency risk. We know that developing local capital markets with enough depth and width is the best way to help investors manage that risk. And together with the IMF, that's what we do. The thing is, that takes time. Meanwhile, you've got to help countries navigate the challenge where they're in stages of progress on local capital markets. So what are those ideas? A multi-layer FX risk sharing facility to spread the risk across the private sector, across governments and the World Bank for longer term projects. And we're working on using surplus local currency deposits in commercial banks to lend more in local currency. The IFC has found great success in lending in local currency. Almost a third of their loans are now financed out of local currency. Fourth, first loss and junior equity. We're developing and will announce in a matter of weeks the Frontier Opportunities Fund that will incentivize the private sector by taking some of that risk off the table. The initial pool of funding will come from IFC's net income, but to have the kind of scale we desire, like the Livable Planet Fund, we need donors and philanthropies to come in and aid us. Fifth, creating an asset class. This, to me, is the most promising longer-term idea in the private lab. In other words, originate to distribute. Not just securitize, not just synthetic securitization. Really build an asset class in this category. We're expanding these efforts by forming a new group led by Doug Peterson, the current CEO of S&P. He is stepping down on the 1st of November, and he's going to help us to drive a group that will include key players like BlackRock, commercial banks, other institutional investors. Our goal is to move from offering small, bespoke loans to larger, packaged securities with a rating agency wrapper and create a tradable market in these kinds of assets and loans. Among other things, this will require standardization of loans and documents both from our side and the receiving countries. I believe this has the greatest potential to unlock large sums of money from the investors like pension funds, insurance companies, and sovereign wealth funds. Attracting more private investment is challenging. As I said at the beginning, it will take time, but we are committed to getting this done. With the reforms we've implemented and others in motion, I think the group is positioned to take on bigger, more ambitious projects, accelerating our mission to create a world free of poverty on a livable planet. And that's why M300, you know, we love our acronyms, but M300 is our goal to deliver electricity to 300 million Africans by 2030 with the African Development Bank. The Rockefeller Foundation joined the effort, and together we're now busy recruiting other philanthropies and investors. Meanwhile, our teams on the ground are developing country-by-country -country analyses of the barriers facing each. 
It's clear that a mix of distributed mini-grids, better transmission and distribution systems, and properly financed utilities will all be important. We anticipate at least $30 billion of public sector investment will be needed, of which IDA will be critical. That work will be done early next year for the Heads of State Summit in Tanzania. At the summit, 15 leaders will join our team, along with representatives from the IMF, from development banks, from philanthropies, and private sector investors to commit to action plans for each country, an example of country platforms that work in actual practice. The IMF has been very generous in stepping in to be thoughtful of how we can use the RST to be helpful for countries who will need the fiscal headroom to do their part of this work. And I think we will find a way, like I said, to make one plus one equal to three once again. Our commitment to scale is also very clear on our objective to support countries in delivering affordable quality health care to 1.5 billion people by 2030. As part of that initiative, we're expanding our focus to help people stay healthy from birth to old age. We're working to reach them in remote places, and we're partnering with governments, most importantly, to make healthcare more affordable. An effort that will be aided by our collaboration with the World Health Organization and with the Japanese government via the Universal Health Coverage Knowledge Hub, which we are launching in Tokyo next year. We've got other goals, like those we announced at COP28 that are moving forward. We committed to get to 45% of our total financing at IBRD and IDA to climate, with half going to adaptation by 2025. We are at 44 already in 2024. We will cross that 45%. Where we have not yet met our goal is on adaptation, because the countries who need the most help on adaptation are also the ones with the least capacity to get these done. This is work we have to do more on. We have promised to launch 15 country-led programs to cut methane emissions. All are online with monitoring systems now being set up to track progress. We launched climate resilient debt clauses, allowing a two-year pause in debt payments. So far, 12 countries, many in the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands, have signed up and more in the pipeline. Complementing these CRDCs, we've introduced a rapid response option, which allows countries to immediately reallocate a portion of their undisbursed funds in times of crisis. Actually, Christina and I have heard back from a number of countries about the value of that rapid response option. And just this week, we set out on two other journeys, agriculture and the point where I started about women and that one lady at Bretton Woods to empower women. In the coming decades on agriculture, the world is going to need 60% more food to feed 10 billion people. With new tools, with roadblocks of the past like fragmentation, these are giving way to opportunities of tomorrow. To take advantage, we're launching an ecosystem approach for agribusiness that brings together the World Bank and partners to help smallholder farmers move beyond subsistence farming and integrate into commercial value chains. Smallholder farmers, that's what we're trying to help here. Underpinning that system is a link from our public sector experience building farmer associations and our government capacity for our private sector financing and access. We are combining this new way of working with a new level of investment. We're going to double our agri-finance and agri-business commitments to $9 billion annually and aim to mobilize billions more from the private sector by 2030. Together, we can reshape the future of food security, of nutrition, of growth, and most importantly, good jobs in the agricultural sector. We're also working towards a world where women have the power to shape their own destinies, a world where they are not limited by either societal expectations or economic constraints. Our job is to build a ladder of opportunity where each rung represents a step towards greater empowerment. To help women climb the ladder, we are going to provide support at every level of that ladder. Our goal is to build a foundation for that ladder that provides a social safety net of up to 250 million in this period till 2030, a middle step that connects 300 million women to broadband, and the top step that provides access to capital for 80 million women-led businesses by 2030. That's the ladder we're going to build. These goals will be achieved with a comprehensive action plan that pulls together regulatory reform, skilling, digital affordability, and partnerships. 
but our work is far from finished. Ultimately, our focus must be directed towards development projects and tackling the root causes of poverty. Poverty is a state of mind, not just the state of being. The most effective way to defeat poverty is to give people jobs. The best way to put a nail in the coffin of poverty is to give people the hope, the optimism, the dignity of a job. So let's turn the page and let's look to the future. The World Bank Group is poised to embark on the next phase of our mission, and that is to ensure job creation and employment are not the byproduct of our projects, but an explicit aim of what we do. Throughout the history of development, jobs have proven time and again, as I said, to be the best solution, the best and the most lasting panacea for poverty. This dignity, this sense of purpose, this uplifting of the human spirit and condition, that's what jobs do. They are the key to unlocking potential. They provide a pathway out of poverty. They empower women. They give hope to younger people, which is our future. And they build stronger communities. In the heat, in the heart, everywhere in these world's emerging economies, a silent revolution is taking place right now. A vast generation of 1.2 billion young people, eager, like we were when we were much younger. Some of you are still young, not me, but some of you are still young. Eager and brimming with potential, these young people are poised to enter the workforce. And Kristalina has been egging me on and supporting me on this topic from the day I started talking to her. Yet, the landscape of opportunity is not expanding at the same pace. We think currently the same countries will produce 420 million jobs. The specter of unemployment looms large, potentially leaving up to 800 million young people without meaningful employment. That will destabilize societies. That will hinder economic growth. The gravity of this challenge just cannot be overstated any more than the other side of this, the potential of this generation to change our world for good. But forecasts are not destiny. You can change it, but you've got to work it. And to that end, we've launched a dedicated initiative aimed at generating jobs for young people. Presidents Tharman of Singapore and former President Michelle Bachelet of Chile are leading the effort for us with a group of business leaders, civil society, and academics who met for the first time this week, actually. And I believe such a focus is required because jobs are not generated in isolation. They require a marriage between preparing people and preparing opportunities. Because while talent is everywhere, opportunities are not. This marriage is supported by foundational building blocks that I believe the World Bank Group is deeply committed to supporting. Healthcare, infrastructure, education and skilling, food security, clean air, clean water, the things we do in our development work. We can help build a public sector that employs people, that fosters private sector growth, especially for small businesses, which account for 70% of global employment, even in the most developed countries. Without small businesses, we cannot grow employment. That work requires collaboration with partners like you in the IMF, with the other MDBs here, with governments. Tools like our Be Ready report are just one resource for providing a background of evidence-based discussions. The work the IMF does in countries with their visits and missions provides the background for evidence-based discussions. In practice, this means we can leverage many of the tools available at the World Bank book. Our knowledge bank experts can help governments and businesses identify and capitalize on opportunities. With a focus on capacity building, we offer tailored solutions from local capital markets to enhancing education and skilling. Our new knowledge academies, these utilize the best practices to give public officials the skills they need to support the development of their people and the private sector. Our capital and guarantees, the ones that I want Hiroshi to do more of, work in tandem to poor Hiroshi, work in tandem to catalyze investment. This is where each element of the private sector lab work plan will be absolutely crucial. And that result can be magnified with digital technology. Digital public infrastructure allows us to reach more people with essential services like healthcare, like education, and financial inclusion. 
digital technologies break down the barriers, they reduce the power of the incumbent. They create new opportunities for innovation, they create new opportunities for entrepreneurship. You enhance that with AI and the data revolution, and I believe we have a powerful tailwind in our sales. We have to harness it strategically and use it wisely. But if you do that, we have a powerful tailwind. This is the beginning of a long journey. We are committed to giving the young people growing up today the best chance of a life of true dignity. We are naive to the challenge, but because we are faster, because we are simpler, because we are more impact-oriented, the World Bank Group and our people are better able to respond. Through innovative financing, through partnerships, we can pursue much more ambitious programs like connecting 300 million Africans to electricity or developing agribusiness in a way that feeds the world and the economies. With our knowledge and our private sector focus, we can help defeat poverty with jobs. Of course, we can only rust and run as fast and as far as our capital allows. So we're building the bigger bank, we're pushing to make good on the G20 calls for an ambitious IDA. At some point, we're going to require an enhanced capital base for IBRD, IFC, and MEGA. From the better bank to our bigger ambition, to our commitment to young people and women, the progress we aspire to achieve demands more from all of us, from all of our talented people at the bank. It requires that we do not succumb to the tyranny of small things. Most importantly, it requires that this constellation of willing partners, those of us in this room and around the world, that we will work together as collaborators. Our mission demands endurance, unwavering endurance, an insatiable will to keep pushing forward through time, through setbacks, and through challenges. What I hope is that as we move forward, our ideas will lead to action which in turn will change lives. And that's why we're all in this business, to change lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And thank you for your support and partnership. And Kristalina, thank you for being you. Thank you very much.